What this lecture is about is not itself an open and shut case. At one level, it's about uh, Sir Robert McGarry's succinct summary of the surprising turns of the law. At another, it's asking, what do they know of law who only law know? At its most idealistic, it's encouraging open-mindedness. At its most basic, it's advancing some propositions which are so obvious that law students and the rest of us can lose sight of them. For instance, that students in trouble with their studies, their university, or the police can still go on to succeed in the law and wider life. That they and we shouldn't rush to judgment when students or politicians or authors are accused of plagiarism or of cheating in some other way. That pioneers working for justice, for instance, in opening up the law to women or in fighting miscarriages of justice have lessons for us all, essentially that we should hold on to the presumption of innocence instead of prejudging others, prejudice. We need to learn the lesson that there can indeed be smoke without fire. And so on. Ultimately, this is a celebration of and call for imagination in the law. In the nature of the open university, three or four times as many people are following this online as are here on campus. And it's a joy to welcome people from around the world, including uh, my grandson Joshua, who is uh, watching in Switzerland at the age of two and a half, <laughs> through to my granddaughter Madeline, who's here in Milton Keynes, aged five months, and many family and friends and colleagues. So thank you all for coming. So are you open-minded? Did you, for instance, predict Brexit or President Trump last year? If you wanted the UK to stay in the European Union, or if you wanted Hillary Clinton to become president, have you come to terms with what happened? Or have you, if I can put it this way, become open-minded about the virtue of being open-minded, and now come to the conclusion that open-mindedness is not all that great? <laughs> so my aim in this lecture is to sketch how reflection on the supposedly open and shut cases in law and wider life might encourage open-mindedness. This could lead you to study a master's in law or an introductory module at the Open University. Other subjects and universities are available. But it might simply encourage personal endeavours. For instance, I've just limbered up for my 60th birthday by rereading 60 books from our bookshelves at home, one a day for two months. So, as everybody has anything to do with the law well knows, the path of the law is... Now, that's an echo of a famous lecture by Oliver Wendell Holmes, probably the most famous American jurist and judge uh, ever, who was speaking to Boston University students at the end of the 19th century. He begins by saying, the path of the law is not a mystery. And that's where he goes wrong. Because the law is a mystery, at least to me, and the path is the wrong metaphor. And these points are related. A path is usually beaten through the most direct route, but the law, like this lecture, tends to meander, or as I would put it, has twists and turns. As Mark Twain observed, the African-American pilots on the Mississippi had to know the shape of the river, every bend, the depth at every point, and to be alert to the fact that the river is in constant flux. This is why seeking to understand the law is such a challenge and such fun. Of course, other disciplines are also full of excitement, and nothing in this lecture is meant to take anything away from the work of the Open University's great academics, past and present, in other disciplines, many of whose readers and set texts are on my bookshelves. From the giants of yesteryear, some of the books which I had to look at uh, in this 60-book workout, right up to the latest book by uh, colleagues in the strategic research area, uh, on Brexit, a book already out. So there are lots of ways of doing this, but in my own case, uh, my subject has been law. And when it comes to having fun in law, nobody can match the only other professor to have given an inaugural lecture in law here at the Open University, the late and great Gary Slapper, who invented and popularized a category of weird cases which did so much to draw students and the public into an appreciation of the law. He had a serious intent 
both in establishing himself and the Open University in the hearts and minds of lawyers and in educating us all. For example, uh, before I joined the Open University and before I joined Twitter, uh, my son in, in the audience here forwarded a tweet from Gary Slapper, which is quoting the Attorney General, uh, F.E. Smith, uh, who was in a case where somebody said, but Professor Holdsworth disagrees with your argument, and Smith said, but I beat Holdsworth as a student for the Vinerian Law Prize. Uh, so Gary was always looking at different angles uh, on the law. Weird cases is one way of putting it. More traditionally, law students are told that there are easy cases and hard cases, and they're not going to get to look at the easy cases. So in law, we tend to focus in universities on the hard cases, the ones where reasonable lawyers could reasonably disagree on the interpretation or development or application of the law. I said that some of those cases are so morally concerning that whichever way you decide, you probably have got a moral qualm, or if you haven't, you probably haven't understood the question. And so I call those, rather than hard, I call them uneasy, uneasy cases. And I've talked about uneasy ethics. But uh, tonight, I thought I would talk about those supposedly easy cases, the simple ones, the ones which are apparently uh, strewn across the path of the law. Now, when I think of that phrase, the path of the law, apart from Oliver Wendell Holmes and Robert McGarry, the other person I think of is GD, known as Kaki Roberts, KC and then QC, a robust rugby player, a prosecutor at Nuremberg, and the recorder of Exeter. And when he was writing one of his two memoirs, he had in front of him his uh, taught examination paper from his student days in 1909. Again, our son Jamie has just said a taught exam taken this morning by students at King's College London. It probably didn't have this kind of question which faced Roberts. Has A, we always like to use an initial, or we did in those days, has A any, and if so, what remedy in the following case? He is lunching in his room, which opens onto his garden. He sees a local socialist, with a capital S. Uh, I say that, I can actually see a local socialist here. <laughs> but he sees a local socialist walking up and down his gravel walk, occasionally stopping outside the window to stare unpleasantly at A's meal and to make a few rude observations. Does A have any remedy? Now... Would you say that kind of hypothetical exam problem is a weird case, a hard case, an easy one, an uneasy one, or a case that is open and shut? If you're wondering whether A has a garden gate, and if so, whether it was open or shut, then you might just, in a dreaded phrase, already be thinking like a lawyer. Now, if we prejudge cases as open and shut when they're not, that prejudice can cause damage to other individuals, to communities, to society, and to ourselves. More generally, then, we can all learn from the law and from the study of other disciplines to be more open to the evidence, to insights, to the truth, to the facts. And this is especially important in this era dubbed as post-truth, a time of fake news. But being or becoming or remaining open-minded is not itself open and shut matter. It requires humility, imagination, constant attention, and commitment to self-improvement. Some people, including quite a few academics, do not want to be open-minded, at least not on our core beliefs or our sense of identity or our insistence that one factor can explain everything. Or to put it another way, we want to be open-minded, but we don't think everything is open-ended and up for grabs in, for instance, politics, particularly not if we're losing. But my concern is with those people who do genuinely want to be open-minded. Not just to say we're open-minded, but actually to become uh, or remain open. And my argument is we have to think about that and work at it. And I'm not claiming to be open-minded myself, because there are too many people in the room who know that's not true. But you can be a coach of those who might surpass you in such an endeavour. So as a start and as a lover of metaphor, what is it in the open and shut metaphor which is being opened and shut? I mean, in one sense, it's a mind, a legal case. But are we comparing it to the opening and shutting of a suitcase, 
an online file, a manila folder kind of file, a door, a gate, a window, a book, or what? Is it something which can be partially opened or shut? Is it something which can be shut but not necessarily locked? Is it a way through? Or is it a container that can be empty or full? And if McGarry's metaphor is going to work, is the thing which is being created uh, as, uh, opened and shut, is it the kind of thing which can be strewn around a path? Paths, or in my preferred imagery, rivers, are not usually strewn with windows, doors, or books, although canals do have locks. But I'm not sure <laughs> that McGarry really thought through the metaphor. Still, an open mind is definitely not meant to be an empty mind. Keeping your mind ajar is not about keeping it in a jar, pickled in aspic. And mind what we mean by mind, by the way, because we have experts in the room in, on law and neuroscience who will tell you that the mind is not the same as the brain. So, the case that uh, I was uh, quoting at the beginning, you've seen there, was reported in 1970, hence the date, but it actually happened in 1968. And really, nobody thought it was worth reporting for a couple of years. So, in 1968, what was happening? Its context was the Labour Party in Pembroke, in Wales. The MP for the constituency had just brought out this book called The Gadarene 68. I can see some of you thinking, oh, a campaign I could join. Free, <laughs> free the swine, The Gadarene 68. No, it's about 1968. Desmond Donnelly's subtitle gives you a clue of what kind of a Labour MP he was. The Crimes, Follies and Misfortunes of the Wilson Government. Yes, that was a Labour MP attacking the Labour leader and the Labour leader's policies. My, how times change. <laughs> not surprisingly, a meeting of the constituency party called to deselect him, not just for this, but for more or less everything. The meeting broke up in disorder and his supporters were summarily expelled from the party. His book's uh, epigraph is about the siege of Pembroke in 1648, which might appeal to Welsh students and colleagues. Donnelly was a troublemaker, you might say, certainly a troubled soul. He hopped from one political party to another. He did conclude this book with actually a beautiful political personal manifesto, but sadly, he took his own life a few years later. Now, why did this case lead to these comments? It was on that issue of expelling members of the Labour Party uh, without a hearing, and the judges saying, well, they might have had some kind of explanation, give them a chance. So, I want to begin a look at some earlier cases by appealing, particularly online, to uh, our law students and encouraging them, asking the question, whatever happened to law graduates in the olden days who were thrown out of university or thrown into police custody. Please do not take this to be condoning bad drunken behaviour, idleness, cheating, stereotyping students or police. But my first few examples are of students getting into trouble and sometimes out of it. Please also do not think that the police have not improved. The Open University, led by Professor Jean Hartley, who's here, has been leading research into leadership, ethics and other aspects of improving the police service. But if we go back to, in fact, just before I was born, back to the 1950s, a postgraduate student I'll call Robert, who already had a first-class undergraduate degree in law, was found guilty of dangerous driving on the word of two police officers. He was fined £40. This was in Oxford, decades ago, as I say. The same student then pleaded guilty to attempting to steal a street lamp and was fined five pounds. The second offence was missed by the media, which mattered to the defendant who had political ambitions. On appeal in the first case, the barrister then had a problem because the barrister wanted to cite the client's clean driving record, wanted to challenge the police officers, but didn't want to give them the chance to mention the defendant's second offence, his other conviction. The strategy then was not to put the defendant on the stand, but to produce a witness, the fellow passenger, and then to question the police officers. But that student, wouldn't you know it, failed to turn up on time. <laughs> the court was getting annoyed and eventually adjourned. 
When the witness arrived, he was looking dishevelled. The judge asked why he was late. He said defiantly that he'd been playing rugby for his college. At this point, the case appears to be open and shut. But what happened next? The judge, actually a deputy recorder, asked, which college were you playing for? <laughs> no, it wasn't the judge's college, but pretty close. It was the judge's father's college. It was their first cup final. So things started to look up. And then the court was more open-minded, more well disposed to the idea that the police might just be lying. The barrister then asked the two police officers the same question, without the other one being present in court to hear the answer. And then you see why I think that this case is useful for the open and shut analogy. Was the window of the van the defendant was driving, and through which the defendant is said by you to have made an obscene gesture, was that window fully down, or was it three quarters down? One said fully, one said three quarters, and since the barrister knew from the defendant that neither could be true, since the window of the van didn't open or shut like that, but had one fixed panel, it was a really rubbishy old van, and one uh, window panel which moved sideways, uh, it was game, set and match to the defendant. And well done that barrister, and well done that witness for the defence. If I tell you that the defendant went on to be elected Prime Minister repeatedly, you're thinking the student must have been Harold Wilson or Margaret Thatcher or Tony Blair, although only the last of those studied law as an undergraduate. But actually, it was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, Bob, which is why I called him Robert, Bob Hawke, who was elected Prime Minister of Australia in 1983, 84, 87, uh, and 1990. He didn't only challenge the police as a student, even more robustly, he challenged his thesis supervisor. He actually accused him of something worse than plagiarism, trying to stop the student from choosing a research topic which would embarrass the supervisor's role in the politics and economics of a public policy back in Australia. But anyway, this case for the, uh, of the window that was neither open nor shut serves as my first example, both for its intrinsic lessons and to capture the feeling of the 1950s. If we go back... Another 60 years, we're then in 1897. The Prince of Wales, uh, I gather the royal family's in the news. In 1897, the Prince of Wales was visiting Oxford and was met by a demonstration. The Metropolitan Police on horseback supplemented the local constabulary, made lots of arrests, including someone I'll call Mr. Smith, a young Don who had recently graduated with the Vinerian Scholarship for the best papers in the BCL, which we would call the LLM. Other postgraduate law degrees and prizes are available. <laughs> Gary Slapper tweeted about Smith's prize and the runner-up Holdsworth. While well, I've written about both of those, uh, and Holdsworth, the person mentioned in that Gary Slapper tweet, was a kind of cheerleader and tutor for Carkey Roberts, the one who had the exam with the question about the socialist on the path. Anyway, the police arrested Smith, put him in a cell overnight, and charged him with assaulting a police officer and obstructing the police in the discharge of their duty. Great law professors came to his aid. Dicey wrote to him, offering him five pounds towards a barrister for his defense, and sat in the front row of the magistrate's court alongside two other great academic lawyers, Anson and Markby. But Smith defended himself without pocketing the five pounds, I think. When he challenged the police officer's evidence, that Smith had hit the police officer, the prosecuting counsel was appalled and said, what do you mean by accusing this officer of willful and corrupt perjury? Smith said, and he used his hand, flourished, said, that's only one of five possibilities. It could be the police officer is guilty of willful and corrupt perjury, but it could be that I am. This is a good clue from a great advocate as to how to handle these cases. Or it could be that uh, he's mistaken uh, and he thought that. It's an honest mistake. Or it could be that I'm mistaken, honestly. Or it could be, fifthly, that actually we're both right, that somehow our statements are reconcilable. And these are basically the different ways in which the supposedly open and shut cases consistently turn out uh, to be more open than we thought. So... What happened to that character? 
F. E. Smith, so again, I called him Smith because he was Smith. Uh, he became ultimately uh, the Earl of Birkenhead, Lord Birkenhead. He was Solicitor General, Attorney General, and Lord Chancellor. I'm going to uh, talk about another Lord Chancellor. You see how they used to dress in those days? Uh, Gerald Gardner uh, in due course. But not every student who gets into trouble goes on to become Prime Minister or Lord Chancellor. Sir Edward, later Lord Grey, was suspended by my old college in the 19th century for, and I quote, idleness. But he went on to become our longest serving foreign secretary and chancellor of his university. Before our college would accept him back, though, he had to produce a plan. His cunning plan was to switch subjects from greats or classics to law because it would be easier. <laughs> this worked a treat and he graduated with fourth class honours. <laughs> Talking of fourth class honours in law, Gerald Gardner, the Open University's second chancellor, who had previously served as Lord Chancellor in the Labour government which created the Open University, he also had the distinction of graduating with fourth class honours in law just after the First World War. He then went one stage further by achieving the rare feat for a postgraduate of being expelled from the university. Uh, to this I shall return at the end of the lecture. Now, it's not only students who get into trouble in universities. By and large, academics are treated more leniently by universities when accused of plagiarism than students are. But this happens through life as well. Politicians are accused, quite rightly, of plagiarism. Authors are sometimes accused of plagiarism. And often what seems to be an open and shut case is actually a bit more complicated. You can now look online at uh, my old university, Yale and Harvard. They have very detailed codes of what is cheating, what is collusion, what's collaboration and so on. But the same kind of thing happens amongst students, amongst politicians and amongst academics. The people are working together. Sometimes they've got research assistants. Somebody takes a note of something. They drop the quotation marks. Somebody's in a rush. They hand it on and then they get into trouble. So, one of the issues for us is how to make judgments and when to know to pause, to consider the arguments, the kinds of points that McGarry was making. Now, one of the great features of this university is its embeddedness in each part of the UK, in Wales, in Northern Ireland, Scotland, as well as in England. I wrote recently about Lord Denning retrieving his lost uh, or ignored lecture, which spelled out that the greatest judges in the history of England have all been Scottish. The archetypal Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales, Lord Mansfield, was Scottish. So was Lord Campbell. So was Lord Blackburn, and so on. And it's not new for newspapers to attack judges. These people were all derided on appointment, essentially for being Scottish. But the open flow of ideas and people across that border and other legal system boundaries is refreshing. And again, I've, I've written about this, about the way in which, for instance, in a case in which the Labour government in the 1970s was denying the rights of Indian and Bangladeshi women to become patriarchal citizens and to live in the UK, the, the two counsel who argued successfully for the women against what was meant to be a great liberal home office, they were both themselves refugees. And the biggest excluded group in legal history have been women. Eve was framed is the title of a book by Helena Kennedy. And even now that women have become judges in most jurisdictions, the law can still go backwards. The Nobel laureate Shirin Ibadi and other female judges in Iran were dismissed as a legal system reverted to a men-only judiciary. But a century earlier, Cornelia Sarabji has been described as India's and the United Kingdom's first woman barrister and as Oxford's first female law student. But it can be quibbles about who's the first, because in fact she wasn't allowed to qualify as a barrister for decades. But essentially, she was a pioneer of women in the law. And she ultimately became the legal assistant, sometimes called the lady assistant, to the court of wards in India. But her first case is the one I want to mention. It was very different. It was what our Open Justice Initiative would call pro bono. So she studied here, she returned to India in 1894, and she wasn't allowed to qualify as a barrister. But she saw that she could represent somebody, a person could represent another person. 
whether or not they were a barrister in certain cases. And so she was asked to help a woman who was accused of murdering her husband. Witnesses were openly being bribed by the prosecution. They got a certain amount for coming to court. She saw this happening, and they would get more if her client was found guilty. So the case seemed pretty much open and shut. You don't need to know any more than that. It was a, a woman being accused of murdering her husband. But Surabji realised that there was something even more elemental than the lure of money in a disadvantaged rural community, namely the weather. She convinced the all-male jury that in the monsoon, it would not have been possible for the body to be left to be discovered in pools of blood in the location in which it was found on a steep slope. The blood and the body would have been washed down the hill. It was much more likely that the murderer was the chief witness against the accused, a man in debt to the murder victim, who then planted the body and blamed the victim's wife. So, she succeeded in convincing a bribed jury that her client was not guilty. By now, you'll get my drift about meandering or digressing. So I want to turn to the most obvious cases of miscarriage of justice. Because I worked in Northern Ireland, I could have used any number of ones related to the conflict there, the Birmingham Six, the Guildford Four, and so on. But in fact, I'll take a case from the 1980s, from just before I went to Northern Ireland, uh, where Winston Silcott uh, was found guilty of the murder of PC Blakelock in the Broadwater Farm or Tottenham riots. He was acquitted uh, of an earlier murder, but it emerged that when he was convicted of this, that he'd been on bail uh, on a murder charge that was another one. So MPs called for the judge who'd let him out on bail to resign. The BBC interviewer you can see there on Breakfast Time, 1987, was Frank Boff. Uh, the picture is there of PC Blakelock, uh, and we'll see if we can uh, play what happens next. Frank Boff introduces MPs the topic. MPs are calling for the resignation of a High Court judge following the conviction of PC Blakelock's murderers at the Old Bailey yesterday. At the finish of the trial, it was revealed that one of the murderers was actually on bail for another murder when he took part in the killing. PC Blakelock died during the Broadwater farm riots of October 1985. And despite the other issues raised by the trial, this morning it's the role of the judiciary which is being spotlighted. A Conservative MPs, Peter Bruinvels, Terry Dix and Geoffrey Dickens, are calling for the resignation of the judge who allowed PC Blakelock's murderer to be freed on bail. Winston Silcott smiled yesterday when it was recommended that he should serve a minimum of 30 years for the murder of PC well, Blakelock. Jeremy Paxton, it was the third time he faced a charge of murder at the Old Bailey. In October 1980, he was acquitted after a retrial of killing a 19-year-old at a blues and drugs party. And in February 1986, he was convicted of knifing to death a professional boxer at a party in Hackney. It was while Silcott was out on bail on this charge that he led the horrific attack which killed PC Blakelock. Today, some MPs are demanding the resignation of the appeal court judge Robert Limbury, who overturned a magistrate's decision and granted Silcott bail, leaving him free to kill again. But last night, Judge Limbury said, I did nothing wrong, I did what was right according to the law. Well, we're joined by Simon Lee, a lecturer in law at King's College London. Good morning to you. Good morning. When uh, the application for the bail uh, was made to the judge, what points would be put to him? Well, the starting point, I think, is to remember that MPs legislated in 1976 in the Bail Act that the accused has a right to bail unless the judge can be convinced of one of three things. Firstly, is the man likely to run away? Secondly, is he likely to commit another offence while on bail? Thirdly, is he likely to intimidate witnesses? Otherwise, the man has a right. That's the starting point. Now, there are people in the room who know that I knew nothing about the Bail Act 1976 <laughs> until seconds before that. Uh, but uh, I, I wrote about it in uh, the Law Quarterly Review and, and generally ran the line that, well, he could still appeal uh, and um, uh, also that the judge had only done what Parliament had uh, instructed the judge to do. Uh, when I then moved very soon after that to Northern Ireland and talked about these miscarriage of justice cases, I like to think that um, that encouraged, or at least didn't put off, one of my law students at Queen's, uh, Tony Murphy, 
who went on to become the solicitor on this side of the, the Irish Sea, who uh, managed to secure the overturning of Winston Silcott's conviction. So, you know what happens then is the police, the media, say or imply uh, that there's no smoke without fire. Now, that, that somebody got off on a technicality. Well, what was the technicality here? There was no video evidence that Silcott was ever there in, during the riots. Uh, there was no confession other than one thing I'll come to. Uh, the one confession that you could say had happened was that certain youngsters said he was the leader of the gang. And he said, allegedly, uh, that won't stand up in court. They won't stick to that when it comes to court, which was taken as, as if he was intimidating. But it was the invention of ESDA testing and the vigilance of the solicitor which showed that even that had been put in by the police. And so Winston Silcott wasn't guilty and the very authoritative tones of Jeremy Paxman were giving us what you could describe as fake news, although it would be harsh in that it was the news as they understood it at the time. So, uh, I think we need to use our imagination more in the law and in life. And I've noticed that while everybody seems to be certain that O.J. Simpson really did it, or so-and-so is guilty, in cases that we barely understand which are factual, in fiction, Broadchurch, we think, well, it could have been any of those men. And then, uh, plot spoiler alert, you know, it turns out it's not just one of them. Uh, and we've become accustomed, line of duty, whatever it might be, to think that uh, in fiction, these open and shut cases are in fact more complex than they first seem. One of the things I did with students at Queen's uh, in the late 1980s and early 1990s was to take the one book they'd all read for GCSE, To Kill a Mockingbird, Harper Lee's great novel, which involves Atticus Finch defending a black man accused of raping a white woman, uh, and asked them to write a mini-sequel. And there are various reasons for doing that. One is that judges are, so to speak, writing a chapter in a book written by others, a kind of chain novel. They're not free in the way in which we sometimes criticise them. Another reason for getting students in Northern Ireland to do this was because uh, Harper Lee says, uh, Atticus Finch says, you should get inside somebody else's skin, walk in their shoes, see the world from their porch, which I thought would be important in Northern Ireland. And I wanted to encourage imagination. So eventually the students said, well, you write a sequel then. So I wrote one, published it in, in a book of materials in 1994, so you can check it out. And when you get a version of this lecture to take away, it'll have my sequel in there. And we didn't know that Harper Lee had herself written a sequel until two years ago, when Ghost Set a Watchman came out. Uh, so in fact, it was a kind of prequel. That was the original manuscript, and an editor had produced from it, um, or encouraged Harper Lee to produce from it, To Kill a Mockingbird. And so there must have been lots of students all over Northern Ireland thinking that was really ridiculous to do that exercise. But then when Ghost Set a Watchman comes out, they think, oh, well, let's have a look at what I said, what he said, me, and what she said. My version turns out to be a bit more schmaltzy than her version. In my version, Scout, the little girl who's the narrator, Jean Louise, becomes dean of a law school, kind of Paul Catley figure, <laughs> and then uh, the first female Supreme Court justice. And I thought it was kind of romantic and just and so on. Uh, in, in, well, I don't want to spoil Go Set a Watchman, but she doesn't in Go Set a Watchman. <laughs> <laughs> and more to the point, uh, reviewers said that Atticus Finch, the hero, her father, had become a racist. And people had named children and dogs Atticus because he was a hero. Barack Obama said he was a hero. Uh, but actually, if you read the second novel, as I have done, uh, it's not the case that he's necessarily a racist. But it's more complex. And I think she had in mind not only her own father, who was a, a heroic lawyer in her eyes, but also the father of one of her classmates at the University of Alabama Law School, uh, a guy called Hugo Black. The father was the most liberal Supreme Court justice of the 20th century, but he had been a senator uh, and a member of the Ku Klux Klan himself in his youth. And I think one of the messages is how it can be more complex and people's views can evolve. And that's not the only way in which we try to use fiction in Northern Ireland to encourage students. For instance, the equivalent of this event 
uh, my inaugural lecture, I gave a play. I wrote a play and acted uh, with students in a play called Day of Judgment, in which, in one scene, for instance, it's like the first day at law school. The students get to act to be the defendants uh, or the prosecutor's counsel in open and shut cases. Uh, for instance, Antigone, uh, Socrates, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, and Shylock. Uh, one of the students, at least one of the students, uh, the one who defended Socrates, has become a judge. His honour, Malcolm Sharp. So he was an English person studying in Belfast. He's now a judge in Swansea. And a couple of years ago, he hit the press as the judge in a case, think what you would do in this case, where a woman wanted to call her twin boy and girl preacher and cyanide. Would you allow that? I was rather hoping he was going to say in his judgment that he defended Shylock, and if the name had been Hemlock, you know, it would have been a bit more touch and go. Um, there are all sorts of ways in which we can keep our minds open. At uh, Ostley Park National Trust on Bank Holiday Monday, uh, our tour guide told us that one of the earlier owners, Nicholas Braybourne, had as his middle name, with lots of hyphens in this, his middle name was, if Christ had not died for thee, thou hast been damned. And that name was allowed in, in the Puritan's time. Uh, and he said, yeah, but that was only his middle name. Well, his father's first name was, unless Jesus Christ had died for thee, thou hast been damned. Although he's better known by a nickname, praise God. So, uh, in case you're wondering, was there anything in Northern Ireland, which, uh, I, any fiction which I didn't uh, publish, uh, there was. Uh, as we were leaving, I wrote a political satire called Remote Control. Uh, which imagines that the troubles in Northern Ireland were brought about in the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis as a constitutional laboratory for disastrous policies and reactions to them. <clears throat> in my little novella, the USA and the USSR take five years to set up the experiment, run it for 25 years, and take five years to wind it down. That's why we had internment, modifications of the right to silence, shoot to kill, random bombings, broadcasting restrictions, a pre-Trump war, and so on. Way ahead of London 2012, I imagined the winding up to have happened through a Belfast Olympic Games. I see now that my winding up period was too short. But in life after the Brexit referendum and the US presidential election uh, last year, including allegations of Russian influence in the latter, I'm beginning to wonder whether the experiment is still carrying on, but in a different location. In my remote control, the American command room was an open secret in that rather like Bletchley's around the corner from the Open University, the control room was underneath NASA in Houston. Incidentally, we are looking at space governance in our research here. But what I didn't include in my satire was how even the enemies of the state might end up respecting the open-mindedness of the judiciary. I admired uh, the courage uh, and integrity of a judge, Mr. Justice Higgins. I read his obituary in The Guardian. What I didn't know was the feelings of an IRA man, Eamon Collins, who had been acquitted on murder charges by Mr. Justice Higgins and later wrote a book about it. Uh, what he says here is that when he was, he was being tried for five murders and 45 other serious offences and the judge, acting as judge and jury, uh, acquitted him. Uh, and Eamon Collins said, the man in the, uh, the book with the, the man in the balaclava on the front cover, he realised suddenly there could be such a thing as the impartial application of the rule of law. The contrast with our system of justice was extreme. What he was saying was, the prosecution had failed to exclude the reasonable possibility that I had been treated in such a way as to constitute inhuman or degrading treatment. So even though he suspected I was guilty as hell, he was willing to let me walk free. I could feel nothing but admiration for this judge, who on such a fragile legal abstraction had set free a man from an organisation which even during the trial had tried to murder him by firing a rocket at his home. And so <coughs> there are cases which appear to be open and shut where the judge decides that they're not. And it can be a transforming moment in society or for that individual. There aren't only miscarriages of justice. There are cases where the carriage really takes us along a path or a journey in the right direction. So there are many other things which you can take away uh, in the printed version of this lecture. And there are many cases every day 
in the news where we rush to judgment. Was Bob Woolmer murdered? Was there uh, a murder of a judge in America, the first Muslim woman on the New York Court of Appeal who died in the Hudson River, sadly, a couple of weeks ago? And the question to ask really is, for me, are we more open in universities, in the media, or perhaps even in courts? There's Brenda Hale, Baroness Hale, likely to be the next president of our Supreme Court. Actually, judges don't always get it wrong. And are we open to surprises in other walks of life? For instance, in sport, uh, you can see what happened here in the 2002 Salt Lake City speed skating. Four people fell over on the last bend, so this guy won. Was it a fix? Well, actually, the pair skating was fixed, and the French judge was suspended for colluding with the Russians to mark down uh, the Canadians in a quid pro quo. <clears throat> but in this case, uh, I won't play it now, but the inexplicable explained is that this guy had done the same thing in the semi-final. He worked hard. He understood that he didn't have any more the strength to win. He'd been severely injured. But he had a plan, a cunning plan. So <clears throat> there are great cases in everyday life where we rush to judgment, but it turns out that you can explain the inexplicable. Although it's quite difficult to explain this case, <clears throat> where two neighbours in Formby go to court at vast expense to decide whether or not to open or shut their gates. <laughs> and the judge, in a Solomonic kind of a way, decided that, well, they could be shut from 11 o'clock at night to 7.30 in the morning, or, he said, perhaps you could club together and buy a remote control the title of my book. Now, again, as you take away my version of this, I want to come towards the issues that face us. I was writing about uh, the issues of free speech uh, in our multi-faith society a long time ago, and they're still there today for us. And you can look at various cases where we seem to be caught uh, outside the gates of the law or the door of the law. We say that's Kafkaesque. We're not sure what we're accused of. This issue of, is there smoke uh, without fire? There is, by the way, <coughs> if you have dry ice. And it's often, it's often a smoke screen, isn't it, literally, on Strictly or something like that. We are trying to cover up somebody's footwork. So if dodgy people uh, are accusing you of something, uh, it may well be a smoke screen. Now, <coughs> what is the secret of being open-minded? Close to home here in Bletchley Park, we know that Alan Turing helped save the free world in code breaking. And we know sadly that the legal system turned into a Kafkaesque nightmare for him. He was prosecuted uh, for homosexual practice uh, and eventually seems to have taken his own life. So <clears throat> as we look at all these kinds of sagas, how do we keep ourselves open-minded? This is that Lord Gardner, the guy who got a fourth and then got thrown out of university. This is him at the Open University. He became our second chancellor. Uh, why was he thrown out of university? What happened was that a woman wrote a pamphlet about how restrictive the women's colleges were in Oxford at the time. And he published it because he thought it was an argument which needed to be heard. She'd already left the university. The vice-chancellor, a guy called Farnell, called him in and dismissed him for that exercise of free speech. So that was why he didn't complete his postgraduate degree. But he went on to be the greatest radical Lord Chancellor of the 20th century. Uh, he'd already argued for abolition of the death penalty. He defended the publication of Lady Chatterley's Lover. Uh, one of the witnesses for his defence was Dillis Powell, that woman uh, who had criticised women's colleges. It turned out that she was right, and he was right, and his university was wrong. And that's a tip for students generally, by the way, I mean, to, to digress again. <laughs> John Maynard Keynes, when he didn't come first in the exam, the civil service exam, said, the examiners clearly know nothing about economics. <laughs> Certainly in this case, it seemed as if 
uh, Farnell, who was illiberal in lots of cases, uh, seemed to know very little about the principles which we would hold dear. So I wanted, before we come to uh, a kind of open forum in which you get to speak uh, and make points and ask questions, I wanted to play a little extract which you can find on uh, the Open University Digital Archive of Lord Gardner, explaining how he was going to set about being Chancellor of this university uh, and why he was proud to do so. Uh, it looks a bit 1970s, doesn't it, the Open Forum uh, logo there. But I am grateful to the Open University for keeping its own record and for all the help I've had from the Open University and the BBC who provided... I didn't keep the Frank Boff, Jeremy Paxman interviews. The BBC, through the Open University, kindly provided a copy of it. If we'd had more time, I would have rolled forward and you could have seen what Jeremy Paxman looked like on the next uh, item. But this is, I think, for me anyway, very moving because Lord Gardner is one of those people we've already heard who was treated badly by uh, his university. Uh, and he had courage throughout a very long career. And he's probably the most radical liberal lawyer in the United Kingdom in that 20th century. In creating the law commissions, he paved the way for massive reform of our law. Uh, whenever I'm in a seminar where the law is being attacked, as, as I was yesterday at the launch of Justice, Borders and Rights, uh, one of our research streams, um, people say, quite understandably, why are we using an 1861 statute to stop a guy coming through the Channel Tunnel who's a refugee from Darfur? And one of the answers is, well, you're only going to update the law if you have a parliament that's willing to do that, a government that's willing to do that, and people, experts, who are going to work on the detailed implementation. We've got a lot of that to come with Brexit. But the law commissions were created by Lord Gardner in the Wilson government. He also led the law lords in their practice statement that they would sometimes uh, overturn their own precedents. And yet, when he came, so he was Lord Chancellor in 1964 to 1970, and then Labour lost. Uh, I'm not surprised they lost, given Desmond Donnelly and their supporters uh, thinking that they were awful. Uh, and when the first Chancellor, Lord Crowther, uh, sadly died, Lord Gardner became Chancellor here. So uh, let's see if we can play um, what he says about how he's going to approach the job. I would hope to take rather more part in the life of the university than most Chancellors do. I'm already attending a, a monthly dinner with the knobs to hear everything that's going on. But I feel that I have a lot to learn. I don't really understand it yet. It's a, a very involved institution, as, as is, I think, inevitable, because it's unique in the world. And I have a great deal to learn. And I'm doubtful whether I shall really understand it if I don't take a course, in for, even informally, as a student, because I suspect so this is the only way in which, in the end, I'll really understand what it's like from the point of view of the ordinary student. The Chancellor, Lord Gardner, speaking so, about his new role after his first official function towards the end of last year. This, this guy who was as open-minded as you can get realised he had to work at it in his 70s. And he decided to take a social studies degree here at the Open University while being Chancellor. He had to do some other things. Here he is walking into a lecture theatre. This is for the inauguration, not of a professor, but of a mace, which he obviously felt a bit embarrassed about. So I'll spare you uh, what's going on here. They're wearing gowns, but they're trying to play it cool. Uh, but then uh, he, in a minute, will say why he accepted the role of being Chancellor of the Open University. Vice-Chancellor to St. John Elstub, ladies and gentlemen. As this is the first time I've appeared in public since my election as Chancellor, I should be grateful if you would allow me to begin by saying what an honor I feel it to be to have been elected your Chancellor. Indeed, I would sooner be Chancellor of this university 
than of any university, including my own. Well, not surprising, because they threw And that, that is because I have always been an enthusiastic supporter of the concept of the open university. And while I shall probably render myself liable to prosecution under the Official Secrets Act, I don't mind saying that I remember a day in Cabinet when I told my colleagues that I thought that if the government of which I was a member was remembered for anything in the years to come, they would be remembered as the founders of the Open University. Some of them seemed to think that rather odd, though what else they thought we should be remembered for, I didn't discover. <laughs> So, I hope you'll agree that that's a suitable moment on a local election day in which to leave uh, Lord Gardner. But that's a, also, a, I hope, a very proud moment for the Open University. That of all the good things that the Labour government did, 1964 to 70, including the law commissions and so on, that he felt that the creation of the Open University uh, was the greatest. And in that open forum, you go on to hear uh, a bit of laughter, a few questions, uh, comments from the floor, which is what we're going to go to now. And I would like to think that those of us who are teaching law and researching in law, that uh, our greatest achievement will be how our students take forward challenging miscarriages of justice, how they go on to be not just judges, but working pro bono, advising people who are being treated unjustly by their legal system. And that if they remember us for anything, it is for encouraging them to remember that apparently open and shut cases Sometimes are not. Thank you very much.